Happy Europe Day 2022. Welcome, Your Royal Highness, uh, Princess Laurentine of the Netherlands. Uh, welcome, Mr. Arthur von Dijk, um, Commissioner for the Prince, uh, King's Commissioner for the Province of North Holland. Welcome, uh, Mrs. Mareike van Dornig, Deputy Mayor of Amsterdam. Welcome, Louis Vassy, Ambassador of France uh, to the Netherlands. Welcome, Mrs. Davy van der Wert, Ambassador for Cultural Relations of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Welcome, um, members of the Supervisory Board of the European Cultural Foundation. Welcome, all of you here in the room at uh, De Bali. And welcome, everyone out there on the World Wide Web. Um, and online because this is live stream. That's why we had this counting here. And I'm very happy that you're all here for Europe Day 2022. We have heard many things today. We had discussions on the European sentiment, on the European public space, on the Europe challenge um, with, the, with the public libraries at OBA. And we, we heard a lot about the meaning of Europe Day um, today and in the past, and when I was thinking what to say, I thought everything is already said, so what should I repeat? And um, I don't want to repeat things, I only want to say that in the past, Europe Day was always a kind of a, well, a nice to have, uh, something you did uh, like Sunday speeches. You said some nice words uh, uh, for Europe on Europe Day. Hopefully, um, you could do this during office hours, um, and, and it wasn't a Sunday um, where you could actually go to the beach or, or, or so. So it was a procedural thing. It wasn't a really a real thing. But this has changed dramatically. I think we have a very special Europe Day today, not because we did it, or the European Culture Foundation. No, something happened, and we will talk about that too. Um, I think uh, Europe Day, this Europe Day 2022, is probably, possibly, um, one of the most important, maybe the most important Europe Day since its inception in 1950 um, of Robert Schumann and his Schumann Declaration. So with this, um, there will be much more talk, and we have a big list of speakers. And of course, we have the keynote speech of um, Princess Laurentine, which I'm really looking forward to, and you too. Um, but we also have a wonderful host um, here at the Bali, um, a friend and partner of the European Cultural Foundation, and uh, Yuri Albrecht, who will take us through the whole day as a host, uh, Yuri. Um, please. Join us and um, take us um, through this nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, dear André Wilkins, director of the European Cultural Foundation. It's very nice to be working together with the European Cultural Foundation. We've been doing this for many years, and it's always a great pleasure. And like you said, it's one of the more important moments for our European future to discuss. Um, I will be trying to lead this conversation for over the next two hours. Um, we have a host of important speakers. Um, we have three uh, packed panels, on, and that's and that's only only very logical because because we are uh, um, in Europe not only after a pandemic but we are at war in our continent again. Um, maybe not the first time after the Second World War, but definitely the most uh, devastating war we're witnessing. So it's it's a very 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 topical moment to be speaking about cultural solidarity and future of the European project. Um, I will be introducing the speakers later to you. Um, I think we uh, we have some people joining us even from Ukraine uh, by Zoom. We have Ukrainian artists. We have uh, many thinkers, um, and I think the main thing we're going to talk about is, wasn't Europe meant to prevent war and make peace? Wasn't Europe about common values? And isn't that what we should be discussing now? And aren't values induced by culture? The only place where they come from, pro probably in the 21st century, is culture. It's the, it's the only way to induce a common values, we, the common values we try to uphold in the face of war and fascism. Um, very warm welcome. I would say the most important speaker of tonight is the introduction, uh, keynote speech by Princess Laurentine, 
Royal Highness Princess Laurentine of the, Nether of the Netherlands, very, very warm welcome to you and uh, give her a warm applause. She's speaking again on Europe, which is a great privilege to be listening to you. you know. I'm not sure that that holds that I'm the most important speaker of the evening. Um, I'm so looking forward to uh, hearing from our friends in, uh, in Ukraine. And I have to say that exactly 10 years ago, I stood here, actually on the other side of the room, in a similar spot, asking the audience to close their eyes and imagine the future of Europe. And I wonder how many people then imagined the world today. So I have to admit, I stand here with some trepidation, I would say. What would do my words, my personal words, matter when only a few thousand kilometers away, war is destroying lives, is destroying cities, is destroying dreams? And what does Europe Day mean in 2020? Uh, Andre referred to it, and Yuri too and in a year that ha when war has returned to Europe. And yet we are here. It is Europe Day, and a day that traditionally celebrates peace and unity in Europe, here in Amsterdam and across the continent. So just a bit of historical context, where does this Europe Day exactly come from? Where is the beginning? So Europe, as we know, is a continent of thinkers, of artists, of inventors, but also of warriors and demagogues. We have a great cultural heritage and have fought the most terrible wars in world history. Now this duality is woven into the declaration that Robert Schuman published on the 9th of May, 1950, on this day, 72 years ago. And in that declaration it said, and I quote, world peace cannot be safeguarded without the making of creative efforts proportionate to the dangers which threaten it. Schumann was, was convinced that concrete, visible and tangible achievements could over time create a sense of solidarity. He believed in the solidarity of production, of creation, and of joint action. So this 72-year-old vision also gives us, hopefully, clues to address Europe's challenges today. Be short and precise, it said. Solve a real problem. Focus on the essence of power, interests, and sovereignty. Make a plan that delivers achievements. Don't just talk about solidarity but create solidarity through action. And it very clearly said, start immediately. Now the Schuman Declaration imagined lasting peace in Europe based on pooling of resources and sovereignty. This sounds basic perhaps, but 72 years ago, this idea was equivalent to a moonshot. Because only 10 years after the Second World War, six countries, including, as you know, Germany, voluntarily came together to share sovereignty in the production of coal, steel, and nuclear energy, thereby internationalizing the hardware of war and creating the basis for sustainable peace, security, and prosperity across Europe. Now, what is sometimes forgotten at this, that this was also a response to the external challenge from the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, it's rarely mentioned in the promotional story of the European project, but it's important to imagine, to remember this in the context of today. So these six countries became the founding fathers of the European Union. Now, we seldom talk about, Euro about politics as being creative, unfortunately. But as you can imagine, this was truly creative and imaginative. The Schuman Declaration and the subsequent creation of the European Union was the most creative political project of the 20th century. Schuman and his colleagues imagined it and made it happen. An idea, a vision that delivered long-lasting peace and prosperity, 
not only on paper, but in real life. But that was then. Over the years, we took peace in Europe for granted, as Yuri also had already uh, referred to. We've been so used to living in peace that we could not imagine that there won't be peace. It made us skeptical of voices warning us that polarization could lead to war. And while some took peace for granted, others prepared for war. And in recent years, it became fashionable to wonder about the purpose and future of the European project. This underscores the need to express the narrative of the European Union of peace and solidarity. We should do so forcefully and in a way that young people will not only understand, but also embrace. We should listen to young people and take them seriously. And we must defend our shared values. We cannot take them for granted. So let's come back to Europe Day. What is there then to celebrate if we realize where we stand today? We've got to be honest. The European Union is far from perfect. But it still is the best political, geopolitical, economic and social and cultural construct we ever invented. It's work in progress, the European Union, and in the best, of the, in the best sense of the term. And yes, it's been difficult, and yes, it has never been easy. United in diversity, the European Union will show its strength. But we have achieved a lot, a dynamic and prosperous region based on these shared values that connect us. So I do believe that we should take one year, once a year, to celebrate the European Union and the creative idea which brought us together. And let's not give in to the warmongering and into the people who want to turn back the wheel of history. And this time, indeed, let's celebrate our Ukrainian friends who are currently defending their freedom with their very own lives. And let's commemorate all those who have given their lives. Let's remind ourselves today that European peace, cooperation and solidarity are as relevant today as they are 72 years ago, and that they cannot be taken for granted. So in fact, indeed, today, Europe Day 2022 is probably the most important moment since its inception. And we have to continue to imagine a better Europe. So what about this role of culture? Well, the European Cultural Foundation here, based in Amsterdam, was created in 1954 with the mission to grow a European sentiment through connecting local realities and initiatives with the European mission through culture and, and education. And in the midst of the corona crisis, we took kind of like a stock of this mission how much of a European sentiment is there across Europe and how far does it reach beyond the Brussels belt? Now, as part of this reflection, the European Cultural Foundation and the European Council of Foreign Relations conducted a study on the state of the European sentiment. We proudly present the results of this European sentiment compass today. And the good news is that it is showing a, European, a growing European sentiment also in the Netherlands. So clearly, the European, the, the corona crisis and the war in Ukraine, it unites us. That is a strength, of course. But I have to say, it feels somewhat ironic that if it takes a pandemic and a war to make Europeans feel European, that is why the study points to the importance of those shared, shared values, shared cultures, and a shared public and media space. Robert Schumann, Prince Bernhard, and the other founders of the European Cultural Foundation envisage a Europe where citizens feel proudly European. A place where they can live, express themselves, work and dream freely in diversity, inclusivity and in harmony. They knew that it could not be enough to share the hardware of war but we also need to share the creative power of culture, the software of peace. So that begs the question, 
Are we up to the creative challenge Robert Schumann imagined? I believe we are. Artists and cultural figures are drivers of change. They give hope in times of anxiety. They provide resistance against dictators and lies. They keep the connection across polarized lines. They imagine a better Europe beyond war, spheres of influence, polarization, and simplistic talk of growth rates. They can help save Europe from nostalgia for 20th century nationalism. Investing in arts and culture in times like these is an investment in our common culture and our common future. Cultural actors and artists create spaces that push us to imagine new ideas and possibilities. They are well aware of the discomfort they create by challenging the status quo to the point of being labeled naive, irrelevant, political, or worse, extremist. But it's their independent mind that drives them. Culture can create Europe-wide experiences. Such shared experiences create a sense of belonging, a shared sense of purpose in Europe. And for the past 67 years, the European Cultural Foundation has, a, has been a firm advocate of a Europe granted, grounded in culture. And it has supported those who, even in the most complex and difficult social political contexts, strive to express their own vision of Europe. Artists, cultural workers and heritage professionals in Ukraine, elsewhere in Europe and even in Russia itself, were among the most forceful voices to warn against Putin's aggression, condemn it, call for defiance and resistance, often at the risk of their own lives. There has been much support to Ukraine, economically, military and humanitarian. Culture can substantially add to these efforts, being inspirational and vital to everyday lives. It provides hope, strength and resilience. And we need to build on the capacity of culture to heal, bring communities together and imagine a way forward. There is now clearly an urgency to support cultural initiatives that, in the midst of turmoil and crisis, reinforce European solidarity and provide hope and creativity for a, a shared future in peace. Now, what do we do at the European Cultural Foundation? In honor of former ECF President Princess Margriet of the Netherlands, the European C Cultural Foundation hosted 11 successful editions of the Princess Margriet Award for Culture, the annual award for inspiring people and organizations who imagined new paths for Europe. The award has brought forward many important and esteemed laureates, and two of them are participating in this Europe Day tonight. Vasil Cherepanin of Kiev, based uh, based Visual Cultural Research Center, and Charles Esche, director of the Van Abbe Museum, who both in their own ways encourage critical thinking and radical imagination. Now, with the blessing of Princess Margriet as patron and namesake of the award, the European Cultural Foundation has developed the award into a fund that addresses the many challenges that Europe is now facing. So we go from an award to a fund. And this Culture of Solidarity Fund supports cultural solidarity in Europe in moments of turmoil and crisis. And it addresses the urgency of today with a focus on the power of culture to unite and mobilize. And to give an example, two days after the start of the war in Ukraine, the Culture of Solidarity Fund launched a Ukraine edition. The fund is now supported by a coalition of over 10 European foundations and growing. And until now, over 1 million euro, more than 50 projects were supported, including evacuation of art collections, providing safe spaces for artists, and countering misinformation and war propaganda. But of course, this is a drop in the ocean of what is required. We need much more. Investing in arts and culture in times like these is an investing in our common future based on solidarity. So to end, culture is 
the software of building a better Europe. Europe Day 2020 is a day to appreciate what we can achieve if we work together creatively with focus and urgency. Europe Day should inspire us to be as imaginative as the founding fathers of the European Union were. And may we take inspiration from the late Polish leader Lech Walesa, who said, and I quote, the sole and basic source of our strength is the solidarity of people who seek to live in dignity, truth, and in harmony with their conscience. The question is, are we all individually and collectively up to this challenge? We'd better be. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, introducing us to the topic of tonight. Um, ten years ago, yeah, that's already a long time ago. Um, and talking again uh, on this topic, you could, you could. I'm not going to ask you how you feel about ten years and now, but you could say that there's a good thing in it that uh, we don't no longer need to explain uh, the necessity of a vital and vibrant European Union. Um, but that's just trying to pour some hope out of the fact that uh, we, there's a war going on and that I don't know whether that's appropriate or not, but um, uh, thank you for uh, uh, staying the course uh, for so long on the European topic, which I think by now we know that it's uh, vitally important. Um, and thank you for your speech. And thank you for the quotation from Lech Wawansa, I think you should say. Um, uh, I interviewed him twice, what a wonderful man. Um, and um, I'd like to uh, start with the first panel. We have three rounds of uh, speakers, so we uh, are a little bit in a hurry. Um, I will uh, introduce uh, every panel uh, uh, when we started, and I will uh, uh, first uh, ask, uh, ask Sofia Bulgakova, Olivier Gues, and Giuliano D'Empoli to join me here at the table. Um, very warm welcome to all three of you. <clears throat> Come volete. <laughs> Grazie. Um, welcome. Um, let's start. Sofia Bulgakova is an art, uh, is an, uh, uh, um, art scientist and interdisciplinary artist born in Odessa, Ukraine, and currently based in The Hague in the Netherlands. Welcome to you. you. Uh, Olivier Guez, a French journalist, essayist, and writer who recently wrote Le Grand Tour. Um, I think that was an English invention, but it sounds better in French, actually, Le Grand Tour. I think it was French. It was French. And taken by the English. As uh, well. Taken by the English. Oh, OK. It's, a, <laughs> it's an old tradition by the Brits. Um, but anyway, you wrote a book on the same... Well, I same directed a book. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 a self-portrait of Europe through the eyes of many writers. Yeah, that's in that sense you could say direct, yes, because it's uh, in cooperation with a lot of uh, European writers. And Giuliano D'Empoli, an Italian and Swiss writer and director Director, founder of, La, of Volta, uh, um, a Milan and Brussels based think tank, and the author of the Seven Ideas for a European Cultural Recovery, just very recently, um, very practical as well. Um, a paper uh, uh, um, recently published, uh, uh, um, let's say, where is it? I have it here, yeah, Seven Ideas for a European Cultural Recovery Plan. And it's very practical, and actually to um, quote the princess, and who was quoting Schumann, uh, start immediately, uh, which was very good <laughs> advice, um, uh, uh, I think. Start immediately. Um, if, um, if we take stock a little bit on, on, on uh, uh, our cultural position at this moment and uh, the sort of the, 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 uh, the dark clouds which are covering it, um, Let's start immediately. Seven ideas for European cultural recovery plan. What's the most important one, you? 
<laughs> put like that. Uh, well, first of all, that was written a couple of years ago, and it looks like it was already like uh, as was just said. You know, it looks like it was a uh, an era away. It's uh, it's uh, it was written in completely different uh, conditions. My main worry at the time was that uh, I was starting from a very basic fact, which is that uh, you can't sell a book or a cultural product in Europe that has Europe in its title, uh, because uh, Europe is boring. So it used to be boring. And, uh, uh, and so uh, I was looking for ways, and my idea was that Europe had a, somehow a culture of boredom when it comes to, cu and that, that culture of boredom wasn't accidental. It was something that we had developed throughout the years and even the decades because Europe somehow had to be boring because it had been so passionate and it had led to, I mean, kind of a difficult position here because I don't want to be rude, but uh, so I don't want to, I, I'd like to face the audience, but at the same time, I'm not really well placed. There are many, um, there are many people looking through that lens. Okay, well. so, uh, <laughs> so there's yeah. many people at home looking uh, so at you. So maybe for the second <laughs> panel, I'll, I'll change seats. Um, so, um, so, so that was a bit the, 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 the idea behind it. And of course, in the meantime, what happened now is that Europe isn't boring anymore. You know, and that, that's uh, good news. And that's not really good news. And ah. that's a, that's a scary part of it because, uh, and, and and also uh, that's also something that we have to 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 be a bit scared of. Uh, there's we're all part of a bubble. You know, people who are here tonight. They're obviously we always talk about filter bubbles and stuff and the national populist. You know, they're in their bubble and they and they only listen to all kind of new and stuff but we obviously all also are and uh, and that's a European bubble and uh, you know we, we believe in Europe in in uh, in a very strong way but 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 we also have some beliefs that are not really shared by a broad majority of the of the population or at least of the European population and I think one of the really scary things I've seen over the last uh, maybe three months, I mean, since the, the war started, is this, uh, and before with COVID, this kind of European policy wonk glee because, you know, finally, finally we're getting together and finally, yeah, Germany's decided to, to invest 2% of its budget on, on, military, uh, on military expenses and finally everybody got it, you know, how important it is that we, that we are going back into history and not anymore into this post-historical dimension where we used to live in and where we thought that every conflict could be managed and, and dealt with, with with legal agreements and contracts and trade agreements and we're back into into history and and but all this I think is is is, is part of the scary part of what we're going through and uh, and I, I understand that from a European policy wonk perspective it might be a good thing because you finally have all kind of of ways of of and, and, and incentives to, to do things, but, but it's scary. And also, at the same time, uh, I don't think we should overestimate the European sentiment. Even the very interesting research that was presented before, uh, it tells us something very clear. I mean, uh, yes, of course. I mean, first of all, people don't care so much about Europe. They didn't care so much about Europe before, and they care a little bit more now within a broader existential crisis, within, between a much broader realignment. And, uh, and, uh, and this opens a window of, of opportunity for, for Europe. There's no doubt that the window of, of opportunity is, is there. But we also have many chances to, to, to waste that. And, and we are still moving in an environment that is, that is very uncertain and, and very worrisome. 
uh, today and then I'm all, you know I can take the floor and keep talking so I will I will obviously stop at, at one point we, we, but, have, amp uh, we, have, amp uh, we have ample time here but um, yeah. but um, I was asking you what would be the most important advice if you say um, uh, seven ideas which if you have to pick one so you're saying it's scary because there's a return of history because um, uh, because we can do things wrong um, yes we can but we can do things right as well so uh, if we have to choose one yeah well for example the second one since um, Olivier is somehow representing the first one because the, the first one was kind of a, uh, uh, um, inspired by the, by, the, by the Roosevelt New Deal. He had mm -hmm. a writer's project and that was a big project for like actually making a self-portrait of, of Europe done by, by, by writers and artists and stuff. But, but Olivier's project is, is somehow uh, uh, along those lines. So I will maybe leave it to, to, to him to talk about that. Uh, but I think that's really crucial, actually, what, what he's doing. Uh, but the second one, just to follow the order, is... We're not um, going to do all seven. No, I'm just going to do the second one, and yeah. just for like 35 seconds. And it's, it actually comes from a, from a quote by Stefan Zweig, who was invited at the Paul Valéry conference in 1933 about the spirit of Europe in, in Paris. And he actually was, was uh, underlining, 33 is obviously a crucial year in European history, and how much uh, weaker and, and less, uh, less passionate and, uh, uh, and less appealing the European idea was in comparison to the resurgent, uh, resurgence of, of nationalist impulses that was taking place uh, uh, back then. And of course, we're witnessing this again. And we're, for example, witnessing on social media and uh, we're witnessing in the in the in the social media environment and this was even true before of course before the last phase and so the idea was was a, a meme factory for, for for europe and the way it's done for example in taiwan in taiwan they have to face a very uh, you know, they're just in front of China and they're defending this fragile democracy in front of this Chinese behemoth. And they're so smart in harnessing even social media and, and, and ways of communicating in a, in a, in a, in a passionate and, and an involving way their, their, their messages. And Europe is so bad at this, so it's so banal to say it here again, to say it in front of this audience is almost redundant, but uh, uh, that was one of the ideas that I, that I think was important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A meme factory, um, yeah. Um, and that's, oh, that might be a, a, a task for artists and creatives, at least. We tried to do the same thing a few years ago here in the Bali by uh, making a Eurolab with Wolfgang Thielmans and Rem Kohlhaas generating uh, images of, uh, by, done by artists to counter um, and to deepen the uh, idea of Europe. I can't say we've been very, very effective with it, <laughs> but it, um, 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 the, although we worked for a whole week with uh, 40 people from all over Europe with it. That um, might not be enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, the task for artists, um, if I can come to you, Sofia, um, of course. Um, maybe first, um, you are an artist. I am. You're, I think wor so. you're working um, um, uh, with your own creativity I and um, uh, making things yourself. Um, how did you um, manage to live through two years of lockdowns and COVID as an artist? Was it a creative period or worth it? Uh, I got stuck in Ukraine for the first two months of pandemic. So I was in Kiev actually when everything started. Mm -hmm. And I came to Kiev with a, um, with a crew of Dutch artists. Well, they almost arrived. I arrived a week before uh, to do a project in Ukraine in Kiev mm -hmm. in uh, Mestetsk Arsenal, which is the old uh, weapon arsenal. And now it's a contemporary art museum. And we were about to start a project. And then uh, the lockdown started a the day they're supposed to be arriving. 
So I got stuck in and they got stuck out in the Netherlands. So my uh, lockdown started with a big disappointment because the project never happened. Uh, and I got stuck with my parents for two months. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great addition. <laughs> um, for me, somehow, lockdown was a lot about writing and grant applications <laughs> and about preparing projects more than realizing it. Mm -hmm. What was interesting in pandemic for me, I had a residency with Isolatia, which is an art center currently in Kiev, but which is originally from Donetsk, and they're, they've been now for seven years in exile in Kiev mm -hmm. uh, because the space is occupied and it's a, a torture place in Donetsk where they used to be residing. And then they were doing a program during pandemic, which was supposed to be a big residency. Was, was that a coincidence or was the, that done on purpose to turn an art space into? I actually don't know this. It's called isolation space. And now it's still called isolation. Grim. Um, but the project was called Landscape as a Monument, and it was focused on Donbass region and Donbass landscape <coughs> and um, re-understanding it, which was great in pandemic. We actually could have people from Donetsk joining the conversation and joining the residency and artists who are in Donetsk in the military state who were having curfews back then and being in a very oppressed situation. They could join and actually participate. And we had lots of artists in U from Ukraine and international artists, and that was a great pandemic experience because it's actually connected me to back home and to the area which I'd never been in Ukraine. And we were developing a project um, regarding exactly the places you cannot be physically present. And we did an AR project with um, workshops with Ukrainian people and people from uh, the Donetsk area, which never got released in the end, but it was a great process of discovery. So it was, was my great pandemic experience, uh, which I would never be able to experience without, without it. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'm asking you about the pandemic, and then there's suddenly, well, there was a, a war a long time, but for us there's suddenly yeah. a war. Does that, um, would you say, um, working with a Donetsk uh, art space, or something, would you say that it, it's a big change for you? Or would it, or is it just that we just, we European Union Europeans just realized that there's, some, there's a war going on. We, Is it for you a big difference? Well, we cannot say that the war just started. It no, wouldn't be correct. Uh, for me, of course, it's a huge change. There was, we knew what was happening. We, I, I was 16 when Maidan was going on, and mm -hmm. then, then I lived in Kiev with my parents, and then our, our apartment building and my parents' restaurant is on Maidan Square. So we, I've been there for a whole year. That was another experience. Um, that was very a lot, and it was very um, visible. And then there's also again there was European and universal attention to this, and then it's kind of disappeared and dissolved. And it was still problems, but you also could not really feel it in the country or in the cultural sector. It was keep happening. Mm -hmm. It's very active. So of course now it's a huge change. And for me it's as difficult as yeah. for me it's also as difficult as for you. It's also very new. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because we knew that something could happen, and of course it was not super easy, and of, yes, but it's totally different right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if we talk about um, Europe Day and um, actually what, you know, will, it, will this bring maybe, um, and I might be a policy wonk or a European policy wonk, or would, would this bring, you know, back sort of a moment in which we realize that we can actually use Europe that's there for a purpose, or is that way too early in your mind to um, talk about sort of those kind of things? I have to say I'm still processing the fact that the 9th of May, where it's a victory day for post-Soviet <coughs> Union, mm -hmm. so, and also because of the, all the attachment to the kind of to the Second World War, everybody was waiting for every kinds of actions today in Ukraine. Yeah. From from Russia, from Russia. From Russia, yeah. the, we were expecting, and now um, I'm from originally from Odessa. Odessa have been bombed since yesterday and today constantly I keep getting notifications on my phone and it keeps happening and we were all expecting something the there are parades happening in occupied territories victory parades for second world war uh, so in contrast with this sitting here in the Europe day in mm -hmm. uh, the Bali it's quite interesting <laughs> <laughs> that's very polarizing 
Um, you, you, you use a sort of a neutral word, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> and um, uh, would you say it's... Um, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Because you say it's polarizing in what way? It's just two realities. Mm -hmm. It's like we can talk about European solidarity and we can talk about things which will matter a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Or it, which, are, which still matter and we need to support Ukraine and Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian heritage and Ukrainian artists right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but then some, sometimes, for me at least, it's, it's as important as what I do. It's, I'm involved in culture, but sometimes it feels a bit less urgent than, than I get notifications about bombings. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of a discrepancy of, of my feelings regarding these topics and also what we're talking about Europe and European solidarity today and what we can do. Sometimes it's like, I don't know where to look first to what exactly happening right now and how to manage this or how we can actually build the future. Yeah. So yeah. Kind of, yeah, I understand. Yeah. It's a bit um, of my question, not really an answer, but something I'm... Sorry? sorry could it's you? Mo more my question than an answer. I'm a bit puzzled by this. Yeah, but questions are maybe more important than answers, um, because it will uh, bring us maybe to um, ideas and places which we need to develop. Exactly. That's also why we're here today to talk and to question and think together what we can do for the future yeah. and for Europe. Yeah. And you're saying um, Ukrainian art and culture. Yeah. Um, would, you, would you equate, or equate um, Ukrainian art and culture to European, or is that something two different things or is it one thing or i it? hope so uh, i really hope so what do you hope that it's european yeah that we are part of this context and yeah. as we see now and here today we talk a lot about ukraine so finally we recognize <coughs> ukraine as part of the european context mm -hmm. but it's always not always the case no. a lot when we refer to say europe we refer to european union where ukraine is not part of or we disregard post-soviet spaces of post-soviet countries we discard Bel belarus which is also European. We discard, discard Moldova, which is also Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's great. And it, it's not great because it hap it's, it's being accepted because of the war and all this, what's, what's going on right now. But it needs to be part of the European conversation. And it needs to be focused that it's part of Europe and it's part of European culture. Yeah, it's part of European space. And it's not post-Soviet space, it's European exactly. space. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, and it also yeah. needs to be referred as not post-Soviet, as Ukrainian, as Belarus, as separated, not to, again, to kind of put an umbrella over it, which is also has a connotation with being part of Russia, and just kind of continue this narrative about Soviet times, which has to be very clearly separated and respected in, within European context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, if it comes to... Um the meme fabric, <laughs> the idea of you know, countering the totalitarian moment we're in, or the totalitarian narratives which are being pushed you know, around maybe by a big tech or by a big states. Um, and Taiwan is an impressive example of, you know, um, as long as they, um, not at war, but <laughs> uh, at the moment no. it's an impressive no. uh, example. But would you, would you um, and I think a lot depends on how Europe and the world reacts to what's happening to Ukraine for the future of Taiwan, but that's a different <laughs> topic. Um, what would you think that there's space or there's a possibility for artists to um, uh, um, participate or uh, partake in something like a meme fabric or countering totalitarian narratives? I think there's a lot of happening, actually. There's a lot of art being created. There's a lot of it in, actually, also on social media and Instagram use uh, of it. It happens um, with the response of war or images um, or constructed narratives and images um, created by artists to process certain events or process certain information, uh, which is actually very useful in communicating and reflecting on particular events. There's good examples of this, of Ode um, artists from Odessa, Ekaterina Lisavenko, who does a lot about um, rape and what's happening in Ukraine from a female perspective. Uh, and there's Aliftina Kahidze, who does fantastic, also they're very meme-like images and drawings representing particular events which are happening now. Um, so there's, of course, it's happening a lot and it's great to have artists actually reflecting and um, working 
and being able to produce works in this time and actually be very on spot, spot on regarding this and having a first-hand experience of their being in, in, in Ukraine. Yeah, so yes, there... Yes, there, there is. Yes, there, it's a there, simple answer, yes. There is a possibility, maybe. There yeah. is a possibility, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, thank um, you. Uh, and do participate if you know if you want to um, uh, uh, break um, uh, the conversation but um, uh, Olivier um, um, if I'm um, not mistaken you've um, tried to draw a self-portrait of Europe in a artistic way <coughs> is that a correct way of describing your project um, it's not wrong it's not really correct. Okay, that's that's a good start. <laughs> well, I uh, I asked. Well, I mean, this is for the the French um, presidency of the the Council of the European Union, and this book would never have been possible without the French presidency because an which editor, is now, at this moment, which is yeah. now till the end of June, because an editor would never have invested so much money because, as Giuliano said, if you write about Europe's Europe. Basically, you have more or less no chance to sell any book. Mm -hmm. So without public funding, such a book, unfortunately, wouldn't be possible. That said, um, I asked uh, 27 authors, one author per member state, to write a text, non-fiction, fiction text, about a place in their own country which would tell, which has a relationship a link to uh, European culture or European history. And otherwise, they were completely free. So they would choose a place, something personal, something more historical, a lieu de mémoire, everything was possible. And at the end, you have 27 texts, and they tell a kind of the reality, or maybe the zeitgeist, the, the spirit of the time before the war. I think this is very important. I think they tell us what was the mindset of Europe at the end of, uh, of a time which started the 9th of November 89 with the fall of the wall. 32, 33 years after, what was the state of mind of Europe? And it's, I mean, I was very lucky because, I mean, I asked these authors, but I couldn't control. I mean, they're free. You were asking artists about mem factory, and I think when you give freedom to artists, they produce things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But I was very lucky because they, they produce very good texts. And basically you can divide, I mean, there are seven chapters in the book, Le Grand Tour, but basically you have two main parts. The, the first one, I was surprised, I was not surprised, it's about the ghosts of the 20th century. I mean, the, the monsters of Europe. I mean, some texts deal about the Holocaust, some texts deal about the communist time in Eastern Europe. I mean, this cultural genocide which happened in Eastern Europe that we Western Europeans didn't recognize enough, I think. We, we can speak about this later, but I think this is very important. The Italian writer writes about fascism, the Portuguese writer writes about, not only, but part of the text is about slavery. The Cypriot writes about the invasion by the Turks in 74. So basically all the monsters of European history. And the rest, because there is a second part, it's about, I would say, the, the common places of Europe. Basically, uh, all the things which define uh, the European landscape, the train station, the museum, the archaeological site, the cafes, of course, uh, the, um, the, sea, the sea resort, all these kind of things that you find everywhere in Europe. So you have these two parts, and basically it gives you <coughs> a kind of a precise idea of the... Um, European landscape and also European memory before the war. Mm -hmm. Always precise this because the book was produced uh, at the second semester of 21 and it was just published one week after the beginning of the war. So it's 1989 until 2022. This is what I think, yeah. yeah. This yeah. is what I think. And when Let's I hope that 22 is not as an ominous date as 1933, but still, it's a big change. Well, we don't know, but for sure, this is a big change in European history. 
it's a big change in history because we have, I mean, for something like 30 years, we didn't know exactly where we were going. And we didn't know who were our enemies. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to recognize that, I mean, the Schumann Declaration, everything which happened between the 50s and the end of the 80s, I mean, we had a, we had a common enemy, which was the Soviet Union. And without this common enemy, Europe would have not grown that quickly. I mean, that was a very strong pressure. Mm -hmm. And during 30 years, we were in a kind of a void. We didn't know exactly where to go, what to do. I mean, that, I mean at least the head of state. Mm -hmm. And basically, there, were, there was no big project in Europe yeah. between the 90s. It looked like Francis Fukuyama was right. So we were sort of in between, end of history, no I, purpose. I don't know if Fukuyama was right. No, but it I, looked like. Yeah. But I mean, Europeans wanted yeah. to believe yeah. in Fukuyama. And I think the Europeans were the only one to believe in Fukuyama because it was very practical, basically. I mean, the idea was to become... That's very nicely put, yeah. <laughs> the idea was to become a big Switzerland. I mean, rich, um, people can travel, people can consume. Basically, we are the Americans to protect us, but we don't really Nice watches, the... chocolate and bankers. Exactly, and money, mm -hmm. and travel, and yeah. leisure, and pleasure, and uh, all this kind of easy life, this easy jet way of life. Mm -hmm. We believed, well, we believed, yeah, most of people believed or wanted to believe in it. Even if there were, I mean, this period maybe lasted 10 years, basically the 90s, but which what happened, with what happened on September 11, there was a clear message. I mean, the world is dangerous, and I've always been dangerous. Yeah. But we still wanted to believe no, in this. Nobody really heard it, no. We didn't want to, because it was very practical. And it's also easier to sell for elections, of course. And, and uh, coming back to your project and the way Giuliano put it, because he said, I, I pressed him to, to choose one um, uh, thing which would be Yeah, really I, I read his paper. And then, and then before. Said, well, the, the first one, a self-portrait. Yes. Maybe, mm -hmm. your, maybe your, um, uh, one, you would, your project would be a good example of it. Why is it so important to have a self-portrait? Well, it's uh, very... I mean... I think it's kind of easy, I would say. Um, would you agree with that it's very important, and why would it be important? Well, I wouldn't say it's not important, considering what I've done. No, <laughs> exactly. That's why I'm asking but, you. No, but what, what, what is very important, I think, what was built since the 50s is a very practical, um, economical, economic, a bit political, a bit, little bit military union. Mm -hmm. But it's not a union made of flesh, of faces, of landscapes, of pleasures. I mean, this part of Europe was completely given up. I mean... The part which is about... About the, the very idea of a daily Europe, somehow. Mm -hmm. We have a Europe which is very good for business. Mm -hmm which is an amazing creation of rights and legal stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting political object. Not easy to define, but it's a very interesting political object. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's going to be a military power, maybe. We hope so. But that's one thing. The mm -hmm. other thing is Europe on a daily basis. What is Europe for us? Europe is a reality, but the creation which was made, which was created, I mean, the last 70 years, was not made of part of this. I mean, I always give a few examples. How banknotes, mm -hmm. I mean, this is crazy. The, Europe, the euro banknotes. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. What do we have on our banknotes? Fake bridges. Nothing, a void. Yeah. Why? A computer uh, exactly. uh, styled fake bridges. Yeah. I mean, this is a nevrosis. I mean, it's, people... It's, sorry, it's, it's, it's a, sorry? It's a, it's a nevrosis. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's completely neurotic. What, what, what's so neurotic about this example? I mean... I think I understand you, but it's nice yes, but explain. you can't go anywhere if you don't know where you're from. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you start a psychoanalysis, this mm -hmm. is the beginning, the very, 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 very beginning. Just say who you are, and then maybe you will know better where you're going. We don't want to know where we're from. So oh, that's we, why we need we know. portrait We know, <laughs> but this was not defined by the European Union. The European Union doesn't want to touch all these issues, mm -hmm. strangely. Yeah, yeah. So basically, we have a void. I will also give another example. 
It's in a wonderful Brussels. example. I, I, it makes it very clear. It's 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 yeah. it's a very very important. Yeah. I mean, Europe produced hundreds, thousands of genius, thousands. Of oh, sorry, of what? Of, of geniuses, musicians, writers, oh, geniuses. painters. Okay, sorry, yeah, mm -hmm. all kind of mm -hmm. geniuses. Yeah, and we decided to put faked bridges on our banknotes. This is crazy. Interesting choice. Yeah, and it's. it's yeah. <laughs> I mean, it says everything about the European project till now. Uh huh. I mean, why don't we have Mozart or Beethoven or whoever? Go or whatever. I mean, yeah. <laughs> whoever. I mean, we could also have a kind of a game on internet. I mean, to choose the people who want our banknotes, for instance. Mm -hmm. That would be a possibility. I give you another example. In Brussels, there is a statue which is supposed to be the symbol of the European adventure. Adventure. What is this statue about? You have a blind guy falling into the void. L'homme qui marche. This is amazing. I mean, in America, you have the Statue of Liberty, and we have, in Europe, a blind guy falling into the void. <laughs> What does it mean? I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, this is part of your new, the European New Roses. I mean, in 2005, <clears throat> when they prepared the Constitution of Europe, all the heads of states fought for months and months about the European heritage. I mean, is it so difficult to speak about our heritage? I mean, you just need to walk around Europe, drive along Europe, and it's very easy to define. And that doesn't mean, I mean, of course we were Christians, but we're not only Christians, we're also a bit Muslims in the southeast and the southwest of Europe. Then there was the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment and so on and so on. I mean, this is a fantastic transnational history. Why wasn't it put in the treaties? Why are we so afraid of ourselves? And I think this is, I mean, the book is, is a little, little piece about this. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to give faces, uh, fates, landscapes about this, the reality of Europe. This is very important. And this is, I think, the only way how we, all these people here around, because we're all pro-Europeans or Europeans, will touch the other parts of the population, which doesn't feel concerned by Europe, or which even think that Europe is a kind of antagonistic to them. We need, I mean, the princess talked about a narrative. There is no European narrative for now. And this is what is missing, one of the biggest things which is missing. So this autoportrait is uh, an embryo of this ambition, I would say. Very well and nicely explained why it's important to have a self-portrait, to know yourself, to know where you're coming, instead of you know thinking that you're coming from no, from nowhere. Um, actually, Lomki Marsh, they they might as well have put the wonderful statue by Rodin, Lomki Marsh. It's a wonderful statue. It's in his museum in Paris. <laughs> they could have put it there. For instance, it's called it's called Lomki Marsh. <laughs> but the, the <laughs> other one doesn't march very well. <laughs> Um, so. Yeah, th uh, thank you. You, you were you were raising your finger at one point. I don't want to cut no, you short. No, because I I think what's important about what Olivier is saying is that to do what he's doing and to do a self portrait of Europe that means something, you have to accept conflict. You have to accept transgression. Mm -hmm. You have to accept that some people will get mad. You have to accept that the picture will not necessarily be pretty or that everybody will agree. You have to accept, if you want to put a face on a banknote, you have to accept that some people will disagree and they will say, why did you put this guy instead of this woman or this other person? And, and this is what the European Union's been wanting to avoid, of course. Mm -hmm. So they've been looking for this kind of neutral identity where, you know, you, you, have, a, you have an hymn, but you don't have words. And, and, and the, so many examples could be, could be made of this. But this produces no energy, basically. And, and so what happens is that the only ideas that have energy and produce energy and debate, I think, are the national and the, and the, and the, you know the, the other the narratives uh, and and the European idea uh, uh, 
because it's refusing conflict, because it's refusing all that. That's why also, you know, when Olivier says we have a longer history, of course we have a longer history, and, and that's, Luc van Middelaar has been writing about this, you know, we pretend that European history started in, in 1950, and, and that's actually what we're celebrating today. And, but of course, European history didn't start in 1950. But the problem is, if you go back, if you go further back, it becomes then problematic all kind and you of need to go, discuss of, it. Yeah. Of course, of pro yeah. terrible problems come up. Yeah. So it's easier to pretend that European history started in, in 1950. But if you only pretend that, then you're lacking so much of, of the whole, and you're now facing uh, other forces, both political, nationalist, even within Europe and outside Europe, uh, that are mobilizing all those forces and energies and things. And, and if we're, we're still in this kind of shallow understanding of what Europe means, both in historical terms and in dialectical kind of conflict ways, well, you know, we just won't have enough energy and won't be able to mobilize enough passion to, 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 to counter those narratives. Yuri, if I, <clears throat> if I can say something, I think this is very important, what, what Giuliano is saying. Uh, the European project is very dated. It's, an, it's a pure 80s project. I mean, the economical part of it, which is the biggest part, is a pure 80s thing. What happened since the 80s, I mean, of course, we had the globalization. The globalization created a huge identity crisis everywhere. And because the European wants to remain completely neutral, as if it was, you know, a project coming from space without hurting anyone, any time. Without any smell or... Basically, whatever. this identity crisis is fooled, this void is fooled by the populists, by the nationalists. And this is a huge problem. And you have two, two parts in this problem. The first part is this neoliberal thing this neoliberal way of seeing the world from the 90s. Basically, culture was something that you could sell like anything else. But you didn't need to think about it, what it was. And basically, this is how cultural services work in the European Union. This is the, the main idea. On the other side of the spectrum, the left at that time, 80s, 90s, beginning of the 21st century, didn't dare to speak about identity. Identity was a bad world. Basically, you couldn't speak about identity, you couldn't speak about civilization. You were, you were perceived not as a fascist, but not far as a fascist. So basically, you had this void. On the right, you were thinking about money, about business. On the left, you couldn't think or say too much about identity. So what happened? In the void, of course, the nationalist took power of this identity. And now we're running after the, the extreme right everywhere in Europe. Because when some didn't dare to speak, or some some were not interested, and the European Union is not filling this void, because it's it's a shallow project in that perspective, because it's always they have so much fear about hurting anyone. We have the most delicate heads of state in the world. They don't want to hurt anyone. They don't want to hurt each other within the union. They don't want to hurt anyone outside. This is crazy, and we need a narrative. And basically, when we think about this, I mean, all this urban project was created, of course, because of the, 30, the second 30 years war, 1914-1945. But our history can just lead to this period. I mean, we have a very long European history where we did some fantastic things in Europe. This idea of transgression is very important for the European culture. And, I mean, we have transgression from paganism to Christianity, to Christianity to enlightenment. We have this uh, transgression of, uh, in literature, the invention of irony, for instance. But we have also the bad aspects of transgression, the transgression of nature with industry. This is a question mark. We have this transgression of other cultures with imperialism. But this very idea of transgression is extremely interesting. I mean, basically everything is there, 
And at a certain time, I think, I hope that the aides of state and the parliamentarians and we from the civil society will dare to use all this part. I mean, just to speak about this identity, just to create debates and then to transmit this history through education, which is very important. I think it's crazy that 72 years after the Schuman Declaration, we still don't have a common, I don't know, European civic education course in Europe. At least one hour for every kid in Europe. I mean, just the basis, the basics of European history. This is crazy. So there's a lot to do, and I like to widen um, where to start. I like to, <laughs> again, I like to widen this discussion and uh, going into the very urgent and topical uh, um, um, war in Ukraine and invite two more speakers to the, to the table in the panel. There's Maria Lavayova. Um, a very warm welcome to you, Maria. Uh, if you, you can That's join so us here. So <laughs> Founder and artistic director of BAC, Contemporary Art uh, Center in Utrecht. Welcome. Uh, one of your main, one of your well-known projects is uh, the former West. I remember very well. Um, welcome, and also Vasil Cheripanim. Um, I can see you over there at the screen, Vasil. Very warm welcome to you as well. Uh, can you see and hear us, Vasil? Yeah, perfectly. And do you hear me well? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. We can. Um, Vasil Cheripanim holds a PhD in philosophy and uh, uh, has lectured at the National University in Kiev. Um, joining us from the UK, Ukraine right now. Um, uh, also the head of the Visual Cultural Research Center, which uh, indeed is one of the laureates, uh, you are one of the laureates of the Princess Margit Award, um, and uh, also a curator of the Kiev Biennale. Um, welcome to you, Vasil. Good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while, and you still look uh, the same, which is um, uh, good to see. Um, maybe, Vasil, can I start out with you? Um, on the other end of our continent. Um, if you, um, if you, you were listening in to most of the earlier conversation, and um, um, I was wondering, um, from outside of the European Union, but from very much inside the European culture, you know, how, how do you listen to this conversation and um, um, about uh, the sort of tasteless and, and, and cultural identity without any smell we've been building around the whole idea of a European Union. Um, would you agree with that? Or, um, and how do you look upon that? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, let me, uh, yeah, Your Royal Highness, uh, my dear colleagues, friends and partners, uh, I'm really uh, very delighted uh, that uh, you are having uh, also me uh, tonight. Uh, and uh, first of all, I would like to express my deep gratitude uh, because I perceive my participation as a genuine solidarity gesture. So thank you, thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, and um, so with regards to identity and culture, uh, that uh, this discussion has been uh, circulating around I would like uh, to make, uh, just using this opportunity again, to make several points, uh, since I'm not sure that I can like um, um, interrupt the debate uh, as uh, effectively as those around the table. So I miss uh, Amsterdam context and this beautiful place of the Bali uh, so much. So thank you again for having me. So first of all, um, with regards to identity and culture, uh, I would like to um, start off by saying that uh, though me, myself, I'm coming uh, basically from the cultural studies background as a university teacher and also as a, a person who has been running the cultural institution uh, since 2008. But uh, at the same time, uh, I think under the current conditions, I just uh, have uh, no right or I just cannot pretend that I'm still uh, within some cultural framework at the moment, uh, just because uh, a cultural life uh, in a cultural field, even in a usual public sense, unfortunately was finished on the 24th of February uh, this year. Uh, so, uh, and I'm basically very privileged uh, to join you today because I still have 
light here and uh, running water and uh, pretty good internet connection as you see uh, unlike my uh, millions of my compatriots uh, and uh, that's only possible only thanks to the Ukrainian military who are keeping the front line in the south, in the south, in the east, and in the north of uh, Ukraine. But also, I think this this is very much applicable to you as well, to this honorable gathering, because if not the Ukrainian military, I think uh, you in Amsterdam would also uh, face a, a bit uh, different urgency at the moment, and perhaps not uh, speaking about. Uh, Europe's day, but a bit uh, different perspective, I would say. So in that regard, uh, if we are like discussing this uh, kind of uh, cultural perspective or identical uh, perspective or cultural deal, as you call it, uh, for Europe, as far as Ukraine is concerned in this regard, I would say that it's, uh, yeah, though I'm coming from the cultural field myself, I would say here that uh, culture is basically not enough especially with regards to Ukraine, because it's rather about uh, not only cultural, but also economic, political, social, institutional, energy, one big all-encompassing deal uh, for Ukraine. Because I think that's already, if not today, then when, uh, that uh, the EU should uh, basically and finally put a full stop uh, to end this uh, constant food dragging with regards to Ukraine and uh, finally recognize Ukraine in a legal, uh, literal sense as part of the European Union. That would be the most uh, helpful gesture from the side of the Union under the current uh, catastrophic conditions. And I'm speaking this really very literally, though I don't represent the state, of course. But at the same time, uh, just uh, some some several points uh, also to mention, because today is Europe Day, but as we know, it's, uh, it's coming after the commemoration day, like yesterday, right? And I think it's especially this year, unfortunately, that we have to sort of face the obvious in front of this uh, war catastrophe and uh, say that uh, it's not just uh, these uh, sort of populist divisive forces or narratives which are working against our common future that we you already discussed uh, though they do exist and they do work against our common future but uh, we have to also to recognize and to acknowledge that it is exactly the europe's mainstream the core of europe that has failed unfortunately so we have to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to answer honestly to ourselves this basic question. Why Europe's never again, which has been a basic stone of the Union since 1945, basically, I mean, in prospect, hasn't worked out? Why only again that remain today? And how, the, uh, how could uh, European Union allow this to happen again? And now it's being threatened by fascism again. Only this time it's coming from the Russian state side, not from the German side. And also in this regard, uh, let's not uh, forget, and I think this is a crucial moment to take into account, that uh, it's not by occasion that the Kremlin uh, used the terminology of uh, denazification and demilitarization to absurdly justify its uh, war against Ukraine. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's not by occasion because it has been deliberately repurposing the vocabulary which had referred to Nazism defeat to legitimize on the one hand its own fascist military dictatorship, but on the other hand, this is uh, exactly aimed at uh, to repurpose the Nazism defeat because this is the only event which allowed the European Union to, to, to come to, to, to existence. Because without this Nazism defeat, European Union would simply be impossible. So I think that's why, exactly why this war is not just against Ukraine, but against uh, Europe as such. Because uh, everything that the Russian Federation is doing at the moment, 
is not just it, it is hitting Ukraine as a soft spot of Europe, but it is the European Union which allows this to uh, to take place. But there, everything that the Kremlin is doing is exactly aimed at dismantling the institutional order, legal categories, and political practices that the European continent at large has been based on since uh, the last of the, the the end of the Second World War. So I think let's also. I'm sorry, but let's be uh, in a way uh, blunt here, Please. because uh, <laughs> uh, because. European, the, the, the idea of United Europe, but also United Europe as such, as a political phenomenon, should have tackled this already earlier, and this existential, really, in a very literal sense, challenge, which has been unseen for decades. But what we uh, have seen instead, after the full-scale uh, invasion, because I, I, I'm saying full-scale because the war itself uh, has been going on for already eight years, and uh, the Netherlands know this very well because we, with Ukraine, you and we, we share victims in the same war. I mean, of course, uh, MH17 Malaysian air, uh, airplane. So, uh, I mean, what, uh, what instead we saw that the European Union, unfortunately, just resorted to some miserable trading. We all know these uh, rhetorics, right? We can give you only seven tanks, not 10, because if we give you 10, it would be seen as a kind of an escalation by the Kremlin. This is just a really, really very tragic moment, uh, I think, just because uh, uh, the European Union still behaves as, as if this war is somebody else's war, if not, if it's not, as if it's not a European war. And this can lead to a really very tragic moment in a very literal sense, because it can end up in total moral bankruptcy of the European project. That's what I'm afraid of. Because, uh, you know, we all know, of course, especially in, Ukla in Ukraine, we learned that this, uh, you know, uh, no NATO intervention argument. Uh, we know this uh, uh, nuclear blackmail uh, imposed by the Russian Federation and so on. But let's, uh, for a moment, uh, for instance, project the current Ukrainian realities, for instance, on the Netherlands. I'm also saying th that because you, uh, the Netherlands had the experience with Rotterdam, right, in the context of the Second World War. So just imagine that, uh, for instance, on the everyday basis, and I'm not uh, speaking metaphorically, unfortunately, that on the very everyday basis, you discover mass graves with tortured and killed Dutch people around Amsterdam. That instead of Utrecht, which is 70% ruined, uh, you have a kind of a huge filtration camp. Yes, yes, I'm not exaggerating. That's exactly the term they use today, a filtration camp, where in order to survive, people have, and in order to get some food, people have to gather corpses of their neighbors and put them into mobile crematoria because the occupants want to hide evidences of the mass massacre that they conducted. And imagine that, I don't know, that uh, Groningen is 70% uh, or 90% uh, ruined by bombardments and almost, uh, and almost uh, doesn't exist at all. So uh, in this sense, uh, you know, Obviously, what we learned that uh, for many, many reasons, mm -hmm. some of them were already mentioned today by, uh, by our honorable colleagues, but this, this is obvious, and we learned this in Ukraine, that the European Union as a force, simply for military reasons, for other reasons, has no courage mm -hmm. to directly Vasil, step in and, I'm and going to... prevent further atrocities. Yeah. I'm going to um, interrupt you, and you're right, it's difficult to interrupt a discussion from outside if you're uh, on the Zoom, so that's why I let you um, talk for a while, because um, uh, you are absolutely right, it's difficult to join in into a conversation from that side. But you're making a, um, um, these are my words, but um, you're, um, uh, if I can put your words into, um, you're making a very strong point um, that um, in a way, uh, this war uh, proves the bankruptcy of the European project because we're no longer able to, pr to provide peace and to uh, defend the core values on which the European project was built. Um, 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 and so it's 
targeted not only at Ukrainian citizens and at the Ukrainian state, but at the at the core idea, you would say, of the European Union. Um, um, Maria, can, if I can um, co have you come into the conversation. Um, if you listen to Vasil uh, and his um, maybe um, cry from the heart and cry from the depth, De Profundis, um, uh, um, 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 unmasking, you could say, of what we are uh, as Europeans. What, what, what would be your take on the fact that this war may be or might be proving the bankruptcy of the whole idea of Europe? I'm I can go to others first. But... Of course, and um, and. I'm going to trust on your understanding about that. And of course, from 24th of February onwards, but long before that, I've been trying to find ways how to navigate between some sort of utopianism of hope mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. negativism of despair. Mm -hmm. So together with my students, I was trying to build a vocabulary, some sort of terminology that would help us understand what is to be done, what can we do as artists, as uh, intellectuals, as, cu as culture practitioners, that is meaningful uh, at this very moment. We came with a number of terms, but I think the most important to replace both hope and despair was the word disillusionment. And we came across a positive definition of the word disillusionment by Rebecca Solnit which uh, uh, who suggested that we need to move forward without illusions. Because I think the European project has been some sort of an illusion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was set uh, here with different, um, slightly more hopeful uh, uh, vocabulary or dictionary, but I think we need to take this notion of disillusionment as a possibility, a small opening, small interstice for us, before us, to move forward, but then without illusions. Mm -hmm. We need to land um, back into reality and ask that intense question, now what? And of course, in the, in the art field, um, I, I tend to think in two I tend to think in two temporalities. One is the immediate temporality, which I name resistance, we need to resist, we need to organize, 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 and do whatever is possible. Orga organizing help, organizing funds, uh, organizing place for people to stay. Um, organize, organize, organize. But with that, we also need to organize knowledge about the current situation. I'm not necessarily sure that we need one European narrative. I think every big narrative is a potentially dangerous narrative. But I think we need to quite seriously rethink how we think about ourselves. Um, our complicity in, in the situation, not just European Union, but of course Europe, I think those two terms shouldn't be used interchangeably. But to, to think our complicity in the current situation, in, in past and present colonialism, imperialisms, and what have you, because when we talk about Europe, we, we tend to clo uh, you know, throw a blind eye on, on a, a less than um, positive um, realities and, and forget to, to think about the fact that when you say Europe uh, at some places of the world, um, um, people understand colonialism. And, and I think we need to dig again through, through this sort of uh, histories and find, again, new vocabulary through which we can narrate histories and imagine futures. Speaking of which, uh, which, through my education, I understood that the colonial discourse and the discourse of imperialism could not be applied on Russia. Uh, I learned otherwise. I think, I think... When you uh, were at school, you mean? At school, yeah. yeah, yeah. In, uh, in then uh, communist Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. But even recently, Oleksiy Radinsky, who is a Ukrainian uh, filmmaker, who was Buck uh, Fellow in 2019-2020, I remember when he presented his project, and said we need to talk about decolonizing um, in, in respect to, to, to Russian, uh, Russian mm -hmm. 
the uh, Russian operations. Empire, the Russian colonial. I, I was very di- doubtful, and and uh, you know, just three days before war, we exchanged emails, and he wrote me quite literally. These days, I often think back to our brief conversation uh, about the colonial thinking in the context of Russia and Ukraine, whether its application. Um, could be possible, whether it is applicable, and I guess it would be much easier for you to understand and prove now that it is. And so what we have is... is and what is would the, have been your answer, or what was your answer? My, my, my answer, maybe not verbally, but no, in terms but, of action, yeah. was to actually study the notion of colonialism in relation to Russia, and I acri- uh, arrived, uh, arrived in extraordinary findings. Um, specifically the, the writings of U.S. scholar Kimberly St. Julian Varnon, who is talking about colonialism, pro, of, of, of course, Tsarist Russia, etc., etc. And I think we don't take this seriously. Um, uh, as to, again, education, this was mentioned here, how we teach ourselves and our children about this. And so I leave the, the, the resistance part here, but it's really urgent and now, and we need to really deal with it. But I think in the field of culture, there's another temporality. The question is, when is what urgent? I think you presented it. It doesn't feel urgent, and I agree. Um, But we also talk about, we we all talk about Europe here. And then um, as a Ukrainian, it's very hard to be here. You, Mm -hmm. you, you, now you can say, now we talk about Ukraine as part of Europe. We are not part of European Union. We can't freely move here. We, it's extremely difficult to be mobile, to work here, to come here for projects, even with, uh, without a war. So yeah. it feels a, not inclusive towards places outside of European Union, mm-hmm. which I consider hear you. Europe. To, to, be, to be honest, it's, it's kind of weird, in fact, our discussion, in a sense that we're talking... What, what, why? Because we're talking about a country in emergency. I mean, we're talking about a country which is attacked. I mean, there are hundreds, thousands of deaths every day, Mm -hmm. torture. And on the other hand, we're talking about European culture, how we could speak about a European education Mm -hmm. and a a neurotic Europe. I mean, we're talking about two temporalities completely different. Mm -hmm. I mean, one is a full emergency, Mm -hmm. which is an historical emergency. Yeah. And... The other one is something we've been talking about without being heard, in fact, for years or even decades. Mm-hmm. And uh, the gap between the two is, uh, is extremely strong. I mean, I think everyone can, can feel it. But if I, if I interpreted you right, um, I'm going to Vasil and then to you, Maria. Um, uh, Vasil, I, I saw your um, uh, remark. Uh, and, thank, and thank you for, for uh, pointing this out. But if I'm interpreting you right, um, there is a huge connection between the fact that we didn't look upon the reality of our history, upon the history we have been living through about imperialism, colonialism, uh, Second World War, the darker sides, and the fact that we're not able, at least that's how I'm interpreting what you're saying, we're not able to recognize that at this that this emergency is coming from the fact that we have uh, imagined ourselves to be born in 1950, uh, to, to, to use the Benedict Anderson phrase, you know, imagined communities, but we imagined it, it started in the 50s. Um, and there is, a, if I interpreted you right, there is a connection be- <laughs> between those very real emergency and those very real idea of what Europe is about. Vasil, um, um, at least that's how I'm experiencing what you're saying, but I might be interpreting too much. Vasil, please. Yeah, uh, thanks. Just a short note with regards to uh, colonialism, what uh, Maria mentioned. Uh, I mean, that uh, let's not forget that these, uh, because it's very much also about these two realities that Olivia mentioned as well. Uh, Because let's not forget that uh, for the last centuries, Ukrainian culture has been not just placed in the Russian imperial shadow, but uh, has been simply robbed of its heritage and modern actuality and uh, forcefully provincialized. And all that till now has been done with the full support and acceptance of the West, which is now very willing to follow a decolonial trend, but is totally blind uh, on the matter outside its own bubble, as it was uh, towards its own past not uh, long ago. And now what we see that Ukrainian museums and cultural sites 
are looted and uh, deliber deliberately destroyed by the Russian military, the vanguard force of Russian cultural colonialism. And as for these uh, two realities that Bolivia mentioned, I think uh, mm -hmm. they, uh, they overlap a lot. Because let's not forget that uh, it's uh, pretty like the situation that uh, the, uh, the uh, United Europeans are uh, observing the unbearable in Ukraine hiding behind the European wall. Because the Berlin Wall didn't fall, uh, fell, didn't fall. It just gained another form, as we know. So, the, so here is the question. It's not even about only Ukraine, but how this observing of, of the unbearable affect your society? What does it do to the condition of the Western democracy? What, so, I mean, what kind of democratic society we can claim or we can get uh, as an outcome if uh, continuous war disasters always appear mm -hmm not unbearable enough to directly act and stop them. Thank so you. So if you thank really think, uh, you know, just... Uh, to, Th thank to you, Vasil. I'm going to cut you short. <laughs> okay. Um, um, Maria, you were saying... Yeah, I, I wanted to say that uh, regarding the two temporalities, if the immediacy requires resistance and radical action, I think that other temporality, my proposal would, would be to shift from resistance to re-existence. And this is where the space of art without illusion, so this is not utopianism of hope, but it's quite realistic thinking about how things are, imagining how they could be otherwise, and then doing everything possible to enact, to accommodate that imaginary. And that imaginary could and should be about what that other notion of democracy uh, needs needs be actually in this in these current circumstances. So this is where where in the space of art, um, I think there is a toolbox that could and should be implemented and uh, and uh, and offered. But again, it it to a great extent um, contains learning co contains learning with one another. It's not a single narrative, it's multiple narrative. It's not an individual, it's not an independency, it's interdependency, which we recognize within, within this space of re-existence, kind of enacting, pre-enacting another world. I think this is the only way, and it sounds very dreamy, and I don't mean it like that, but I think we need to operate these two possibilities at the same time, resistance and re-existence. Uh, what cannot be imagined cannot be built. And I think this is what we need to t uh, this is what we need to take very seriously in our field. So all of you raising a finger, yeah. Sophia. It was kind of uh, floating. It was many thoughts. No, we just um, you mentioned that we were talking about <clears throat> European culture in, and we talk about <clears throat> country at war and emergency, uh, but we're not talking about how can we help. Ukrainian culture community, which is Vasil has mentioned, does not exist because of the state. But there's still people, there's still artworks, there's still museums which are looted, which are bombed, which are completely and destroyed. There are artists who used to earn their money and their living with producing works and projects, and then cannot do this anymore. And then how do we implement it? How do we complement European solidarity for culture sector? For people who actually need it, who need to be recognized here, who are now in, who are now moved away from where are, or as Vasil, they are still in Ukraine, and they need support. And we're not talking about this. We're not talking about immediate actions of how we can help this particular people. And if we're talking about culture sector, which is what we all do, how we can help the same sector in a country which is at war, which is a European country at war, and how we can save those museums, save those artworks make sure they don't get destroyed, at least try to protect it and try to protect people who are involved in this. So yes, if you have any... But you already presented before our talk, you've done lots of fundraisers, because this... this I don't know whether this can be talked about in, in general terms. Yeah. There is there's enormous solidarity going on. It's never enough. But you yourself did a couple of fundraisers. Yeah, we did collect money, money for uh, Museum Crisis Center, uh, which helps museums and to, to evacuate artworks. Uh, also, Ukrainian Emergency Art Fund. Uh, yeah, we were doing a fundraiser W139 last month. Um, but still, it's not enough, as you're saying. 
and it's still yeah and it's yeah as when I was still saying that there's no culture there's no culture anymore it's not important anymore but there's yeah there's still people who who need this who need support but if i can add something to this terribly difficult discussion so it's really one of the toughest that i've ever participated in and that's also because of what olivier was saying i mean the the plans are uh, are too different but one thing i'm sure of is that culture is at the center of this war and uh, uh, and that it's a mistake for artists or people involved in culture to think that you know now it's maybe not the time for that and it's uh, it's it's difficult to 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 be in culture in this in this moment because there are more urgent things i i think i mean this was a war that was declared uh, by a, a rambling historical speech reconstruction uh, by by Putin uh, who who kind of declared war by 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 kind of rambling on about about Ukrainian mm-hmm. history and 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 when we look at Putin uh, and the wars he's led before uh, culture has always been important in and strategic in the way he operates if you remember syria uh if you remember palmyra and how important palmyra was i mean palmyra was a place that was taken by isis in 2015 and they beheaded 25 foreign fighters there and started destroying like some of the monuments and and putin put a huge kind of like fire um, power into into retaking Palmyra and staged a, a Marinsky concert theater concert in in 2016 in the in the Palmyra um, theater and uh, and 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 he gave a speech there mm-hmm. remotely and and then it was taken again by 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 uh, um, by Isis and and if you look at ukraine of course i mean we've seen what happened in in mariupol with the, with the bombing of the theater and this incredible thing that uh, the the blue shields that were actually decided in the in the hague convention in in uh, in 1954 uh, you know the idea was that even in war you would I mean, participating. Of course, I don't have to say it to you, uh, but uh, but but that you would be able to 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 protect uh, monuments and culturally significant heritage sites by putting a, a blue shield on it so that it wouldn't get destroyed and targeted. These blue shields are now, I mean, they're making it more of a target. I mean, if you put a blue shield on a, on a monument or a site in, in Ukraine nowadays, you, you can be sure that it would be targeted doubly by, 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 by the Russians. And, and so this, I mean, this also shows uh, how important this this component is, and again, we're unprepared for this, you know. So we're still putting blue shields because that's our mentality. But we will need to snap out of this really fast. I, just, I think just you have uh, one closing remark, and then I'm going to the last panel. I promise three panels. <laughs> yeah, sure. So. No, just very quickly to, to this idea of imperialism. I think it's very important, and th- this is. I think one of the main reasons between the schism between the eastern part of Europe and the western part of Europe, that the western part of Europe never wanted to understand that behind this idea of socialism, it was pure Russian imperialism. And this is something that we never really wanted to fully recognize. And I was in Bratislava, for instance, two weeks ago, and I was with a Slovak writer of the anthology. And he told me the story of Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir in Bratislava in 63. And they were, they were expected by the students because they were stars and philosophers and from the, the free world. And what 
Sartre and Beauvoir told these young people, they have to work harder on uh, uh, real socialism, le socialisme réel. And that was a full, there was a full mistake between, uh, of misinterpretation between the West and the East. That's one thing. And I think that, especially in Western Europe, the intellectuals never really wanted to understand how the people of Eastern Europe suffered so much because of Russians and because of communism. That's one thing. The other thing, very quickly, that we're talking about a culture war. What is the culture of Europe since the war? It's a, it's a culture of memories. I mean, Europe is the only continent which has been working on its memory like that. I mean, digging and digging and digging and digging, recognizing its crimes, I mean, the fascists, the colonialists, and so on and so on. Russia has done exactly the opposite. It completely reinvented its history. I mean, there was never any crime under Stalin. There was never any crime under the Soviet Union. There was not even Chernobyl. And this is a complete reinvention of history. So on one part of the continent, you have a full recognition of memories, which is also something which is very difficult for us, I mean, as European people, in fact, to mobilize against something because we deconstructed so much of our history. And on the other hand, you have a country which became a full dictatorship, and as any dictatorship, which is reinventing its past to mobilize all its forces. And this is what's happening in Ukraine now. Yeah, um, the specters of history and, and the un, sort of the undigested parts of history which coming back with vengeance to uh, to uh, to put it nicely nip us in the butt but it's much worse than that of course um, um, I think what we touched upon about how you can use culture and history to wage war or to not see that fascism is growing under your feet or that that it's I think that's very important what we touched upon I think I'd like to thank you all um, the five of you for uh, this intense conversation. I think you're right. It's very, very, very difficult to talk upon these things while we are at war in uh, this continent. It is even more um, uh, honest and uh, praiseworthy that you do actually in the open participate in a conversation like this. Thank you very much, all five of you. Um, I'm going to move and ask you, I'm going to ask you to uh, take one of the seats in the front row and I'm going to move to the last panel and um, uh, <laughs> because now we're moving into the realm of diplomats and um, uh, um, <laughs> uh, to see um, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Gijs de Vries, Davy van der Weert and Louis Vassy, Louis Vassy uh, to um, uh, take one of those three seats. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, Gijs de Vries, a former Dutch politician, expert in the subject on international and cultural relations, senior visiting fellow at London School of Economics. Um, welcome. Um, Davy van der Weert, Ambassador for International Cultural Cooperation in the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Welcome to you too. And Louis Vassy, French Ambassador to the Netherlands and uh, a French diplomat, of course. So um, we, have, um, uh, we have had an intense conversation on history and um, uh, uh, the sort of return of the whole cultural war which is raging in Europe, and maybe the demask of uh, the idea of Europe by the fact that um, we're not able to prevent anything happening like what's happening in Ukraine at the moment. Um, um, maybe, um, maybe to start with you, Gijs de Vries, if I may. Um, <laughs> um, if you. We've started out with seven ideas for a European cultural recovery plan. Um, we, um, we've gone into sort of the depth of, um, uh, of our history and the fact that we have not touched upon our colonial history, maybe misinterpreted the colonial history of the Russians, uh, not looked upon our, our own colonial history. Um, if, you, um, if you listen to this, do you think that um, we, for a long time, time under, that we underperformed in Europe uh, by tending to our cultural heritage and our cultural um, uh, possibilities? 
I think we certainly underperform. Um, if I may uh, pick up Giuliano's point, who reminded us of Putin's concert in Palmyra. Mm -hmm. He has a clear political view of culture. We should have a similarly political view of culture. And the starting point then is now to reach out to the Ukrainian artists uh, who have had to leave their country or who are still in the country without being able to work. Mm -hmm. There should have been already an integrated, coordinated European response, a cultural response, to help these artists. There have been some initiatives. ECF uh, has spent a million, wonderful, an excellent, really leadership initiative from the civil society. Germany has put aside a million, mostly for media people. France has put aside a fund, I believe, about a million. So there are a number of initiatives, but they are not tied up. And what so, so bothers we, me so about this... we might have three, four, five million and, uh, and a hundred billion for extra money for weapons by no, the Germans I, alone. I, I, I think I, I stay out of that comparison because there's a lot to be said about apples and pears. But mm -hmm. on the cultural sure. point, what bothers me is that Europe has not learned from last year's experience in Afghanistan. Which when is? the Taliban took over in Afghanistan in August, many Afghan artists were forced to leave Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Again, different European countries acted in different ways without there being a joint European coordination. The European Commission should have learned from that. It should have used its own policy paper of 2016 in which it said it wanted an external cultural policy of the European Union. Well, if ever there was an occasion for that, it is now. So the first thing that needs to happen now... Because to have that, are destroyed in Ukraine because people are in direct need. Precisely. The first thing is to reach out to people. The second thing is to help protect the stones. Um, UNESCO has already said that about 43 major Ukrainian monuments uh, have been damaged by the Russian attack. We need to help preserve what is left. And that also means more European coordination. Again, we have the same story, different countries do different things, but mm -hmm. Europe doesn't act together. Why do I make that point? Not only because of the inherent importance of helping the cultural sector, but also because it would be a hugely powerful symbolic act for Europe to counter the Russian interpretation of culture by having our collective approach to help cultural people in need and to defend their cultural freedom. That is what the EU should be doing now as a priority. Would you agree with Vasil Khiripanem that in a way this war you know, is a demask of our whole European idea if we're not able to get our act together and defend citizens in Ukraine? I think it was a bit of an overstatement. Why? Um, because there has never been, I'm, I'm going to agree with him in a minute uh, uh, on, on what he has said, but I'm going to disagree with him first. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a bit of an overstatement to suggest that Europe hasn't done a thing. Uh, this is the first time that the European Union has granted military aid to a country outside the European Union. This is the most important and far-reaching sanctions package that the EU has ever agreed, and we're now finally going to talk about oil. We should have done that earlier, in my opinion, but finally that is happening. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about, and this is the key point that happens, has to happen now, the possibility of opening a membership perspective for Ukraine. I believe that should have happened already. I believe the European Union should have a more political response to the crisis in Ukraine. The Ukrainians are fighting for freedom, for democracy, for the rule of law, for liberty, for the right to determine their own future. Those are European values. Those are the absolute core European values of the European Union. They are fighting for our values. And the least we can do in moral terms is to reach out to Ukraine, which has earned its right to open membership negotiations with the EU. We still need, obviously, to insist on conditions that have to be met. Um, Ukraine has to reform economically, it has to, uh, to reduce its levels of corruption, which before the war were very, very impressive. It has to strengthen its rule of law. But we need to embark on a massive program of assistance for Ukraine to help that process along. Meanwhile, I think, and this is the critical challenge for the EU, beyond Ukraine in an immediate sense, because democracy is at risk in this war, this also offers an opportunity for the EU to rethink its own democratic model, to rethink how we can strengthen the democracy in the European Union as it exists today, by taking the situation in Hungary much more seriously, for example, but also by taking the anger of so many young Europeans more seriously. 
Half of the British young people did not vote in the last British general election. There's deep disenchantment with democracy in Europe. Many young French people did not participate in the uh, presidential vote. Uh, there was a, an opinion poll done by a research done by uh, University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands last year about what Dutch young people in schools think about democracy. 49% of Dutch young people think democracy is not important to them. Those are shocking figures. So this is an opportunity, this crisis, for the EU also to embrace its own democratic heritage and to revitalize the democratic foundations of the EU and the member states. It's a huge opportunity for Europe, this crisis. It's probably the most important moment in European history since the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. And just... And just so happens that the French are in the presidency in the most important moment um, <laughs> on um, um, would you would you Louis Vassy, um would you agree that we need a foreign cultural policy look first of all I, I, well that's um, I, I get to your question but um, in in a way um, I don't, I don't really think that's the main question right now. Um, I think we need to create, um, bef before having a, uh, an external cultural policy, we need to also know uh, what we stand for from a cultural standpoint or for, from a value standpoint uh, as, as a body, let's say. And the body uh, is a European Union uh, As a Euro European Union body. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, um, that, that's why I think, uh, as you know, under our presidency, we've decided even before uh, the start of the, the conflict in Ukraine to, to have these, these three pillars uh, presidency, the third one being the uh, issue of belonging. And how do you, in fact, define Europeanness or togetherness in the context of the European Union? Um, there, a lot has been said, frankly, in the first two panels, so I don't want to repeat what has been said very ably by the, the previous speakers, but I have to say that I am, frankly, strongly in the camp of those that think that we need a European narrative. Um, why is that? Um, because um, if you don't have a common narrative, a common vision of what you stand for and where you come from, by the way, including looking into the dark pages of your history, but not necessarily only these pages. I have to say that uh, coming from France, for example, I have, I have a difficulty with the notion that we have never visited our, the dark pages of our history. I mean, I am now old enough, 42, that I was at school 30 years ago, and I remember vividly having uh, history lessons about the occupation, collaboration, in the Algeria war, colonialism, I mean, the, the, this notion that Europe doesn't revisit its history at least doesn't frankly apply to my country, I would say, and I don't think it's, it, it applies necessarily to many countries in, in Europe. I would certainly agree with, uh, I think it was the point made by uh, Olivier Guez, that uh, we are certainly the cultural space that looks uh, into itself, let's say, uh, the more. I mean, I'm not aware that the Chinese are, have a very particularly uh, uh, profound uh, south searching about their history. Um, I don't think the Turks look into the Ottoman Empire with uh, the notion that it's been uh, colonizing uh, half of the Mediterranean, for example. So in a way, um, this is part of us, but it's not the only part of, of us, and we need to also define, I think it's a point also made by Luc van Middelaar in uh, many of these, uh, his recent articles, we need to be able to define ourselves and define the common narrative that, we, that, that binds us together. And there are frankly, as has been said, many, many foundations to do that. Uh, it has, there is a historical aspect, there is a cultural aspect, um, there is a landscapes uh, has aspect, as has been said. Uh, lieu de mémoire. Uh, the, the, there are uh, lieux de mémoire that are uh, European, uh, including, by the way, outside of the European Union. When I went to uh, Kiev only one time in 20... 
17, I believe, or 18, uh, I visited Bab Babi Yar, the site where the Jews of Kiev had been uh, massively assassinated, and I felt it was completely part of the European history, of course. So we, we need to be, to be able to do that. At the same time, and that's where we differ from the Russians and the consuls in Palmyra, we need to do it, and that's where it's more complicated, without negating ourselves. We are democracies, and so it's not going to uh, be the role of the state or state-sanctioned authorities to define that narrative. So that's why, I guess, under um, our presidency, we've been pushing not so much for being the ones that define the narrative, but maybe uh, in seeing our, our role as creating the safe space so that others civil society, intellectuals, historians, philosophers, writers, artists, are able to uh, contribute to the definition of what we are as Europeans. And of course, in the end, hopefully, as has just been said, we will also end up in a with a definition that is mm, uh, deeply rooted into a values-based uh, Europeanness. Um, the ability to discuss issues and debate and uh, exchange ideas, freedom of expression, individual freedoms and autonomy, uh, capacity to um, democratic institutions, capacity to regulate our disagreements through uh, dialogue and democratic institutions, all that is of course part of us. That's not exclusively European though. You have these notions, for example, in Northern America also. So I guess what we add also as Europeans is a sense of solidarity. And I think that's uh, indeed, as has been said, what's at stake when we look at the Ukraine crisis. It's, uh, or the war in Ukraine, it's our ability and the extent to which we are able to um, uh, act in solidarity with the Ukrainians. Once we have done all that, I guess we'll be ready to have an external cultural policy. Before that, I find it uh, difficult because we won't know what we will be promoting. And I think we need first to be, um, to, to, to understand what we stand for, where we come from, and what we, what we are. Um, that could take a while, of course. No, I think, I, I think maybe I've been too long, but a, a, a last point. If we don't define our narrative ourselves, others will define us from the outside. The Russians know what we are in their view. We are a band of degenerate, uh, weak people that are unable to sustain pressure and war. So they have a definition and a, and a narrative about ourselves. The Chinese have a narrative about ourselves. They were very clear during COVID. We are people... Uh, um, um, uh, uh, un, uh, un, people difficult to rule, not abiding by uh, by, by by regulations, uh, n n not uh, n yeah, not not a, not acting according to regulations, and so and and because of that we are declining. So people from the outside have actually a narrative about ourselves, um, and if we don't take back control of our narrative as Europeans, I think uh, we 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 leave this huge space from the outside for others to be defining us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe from the inside as well, the nationalists uh, we talked that's about. A, that's a point that was done previously, but I would add that from the outside there is a strong pressure to define what we are as Europeans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the Chinese or the Russians? Or the Chinese, for example, Americans. during the COVID crisis had a very, this incredible thing that they were pushing all the stories um, uh, in which uh, there was mismanagement of the COVID crisis. For example, at some point they, they created a story that uh, uh, older people had been abandoned in the care houses in France uh, to the point that we had to summon the Chinese ambassador to, to Paris uh, to ask him to stop, uh, I mean, basically spreading fa fake news about France. So that exists, basically. It comes from the outside. The Russians do it more than the Chinese, I would argue, but still it's very present. And if we don't define what we are, if we don't say we are democratic, we act in solidarity, we have a history, good and bad, uh, we will let others take control of, of our narrative. I'm trying to, I'm going to uh, push my luck and ask uh, Davy van der Weert the, the same thing in a way. Um, but in the meantime, there's real need in Ukraine. 
Um, and though I do understand the point, of course, that um, uh, it's important to know what you're going to represent, and as a diplomat, you would probably also agree with Louis Lassi. But in the meantime, we've spoken to artists, and, and there, is, um, there is this uh, horrible bombard bombardation of the stones, and not the Rolling Stones, but the, the, the churches and, and, and monuments in, 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 in Ukraine and the, the, the artists. Shouldn't we, in the meantime, we have, emerged, we have uh, sent a few howitzers to a few cannons uh, as, as, as Holland to, uh, as the Netherlands to Ukraine. Shouldn't we in the meantime have an emergency policy on, you know, um, uh, should have learned from Kabul, uh, should have learned, should we be going that well, direction? I mean, I, I fully agree with you uh, that we should, and it is actually also happening um, on the ground. And um, I agree with uh, Gijs and Fries that maybe, um, you know, we could have uh, uh, thought about this, uh, let's say, more in a more focused way as a European Union uh, before. But uh, within the EU and with UNESCO uh, and different organizations uh, uh, in several EU countries, we are actually working very hard um, in Ukraine uh, on securing, uh, helping to secure, let's say, um, uh, heritage. Um, uh, trying to bring uh, certain uh, uh, works uh, to safety, uh, packing, uh, packing things. There have been a lot of actions um, uh, to bring material actually to, uh, to, to, to have very practical assistance and working with a lot of organizations, artists, um, institutions on the ground and also in fact supporting uh, artists and of course there have been huge numbers of artists fl fleeing also to European countries and um, actually, uh, many uh, different countries are having all kinds of initiatives of, uh, for example, in The Hague, we are uh, supporting a Ukrainian uh, dance company. At Amare, they're they are going to be hosted. Um, so there's, there's many of these different initiatives uh, going on, uh, but it's maybe not that visible. There is also coordination, actually. Uh, uh, so the different partners that are working on that are uh, trying to do that uh, as much as possible uh, in cooperation and, and, and together with, uh, with the main Ukrainian act actors. But yeah, it's of course a, a crisis and, and, uh, and a very complicated uh, situation in which you can never do enough. And I think yeah, one of the things that we keep uh, underestimating is, in fact, that um, uh, yeah, these objects are real targets. Uh, and so, um, yeah, we need to really also try to think steps ahead. And, and, and I heard, for example, discussions about artists that were saying, we would like to have our work saved in the cloud uh, for if, if something happens. Mm -hmm. um, um, well, we have also seen here in Holland um, that several uh, media outlets from Russia are now operating uh, from, from out of the Netherlands. Um, there is, of course, also the aspect of uh, Russian uh, artists uh, uh, and, and art directors that have also fled their countries and that also need our support. Yep. So, um, so yes, I fully agree that you know we really need to act, and I think it is also happening. Uh, but yeah, it is it, it is a very complicated uh, uh, situation because it's moving so fast and changing uh, changing all the time. And what we will surely also need to do, and there is actually also a lot of thought about that already, is a, at some stage to look ahead at a build-up phase again. Uh, and how uh, can we, um, as Europe, uh, assist uh, Ukrainians um, uh, in in a time when when it will be possible uh, to look at um, uh, yeah re reopening and and re renovating uh, heritage, etc. And there is actually also a lot of thought about that and also um, documenting uh, what is actually currently being destroyed as part of that, uh, but also documenting that uh, for accountability reasons uh, to uh, make sure uh, that afterwards uh, we can also very clearly say uh, this, this is what has happened and, and who should be ac held accountable for that. Mm -hmm. I think this, this whole crisis invites all Europeans to think bigger to ask some really big existential questions about who we are and who we want to be and what we are willing to do to get there. Um, there is a certain uh, self-evidence about how the European Union has been a success so far. And indeed, it has been a huge success in terms of the peace between France and Germany, the fact that it has, the EU has allowed Germany to unify peacefully, the fact that we've taken on board former dictatorships in Spain, in, in Greece and in Portugal, I can go on and on and on. The enlargement with many countries that have formerly been communists, huge historic achievements. But we cannot 
mentally rest on these laurels. There is a new agenda. And that agenda first means to defend democracy where it is now at risk. And that is a cultural and ideational challenge that we have to come up uh, against. So that means making Ukraine a success. We have to do everything to help Ukraine to make Ukraine a success as a democratic, free, and prosperous nation. Not only because of our values, but also because of our interests. Because if we do that with the Ukrainians, if we help Ukraine to become that success, that is our best way to influence Russia. Do not forget why Russia has invaded Ukraine in 2014, why it occupied the Crimea. That was in revenge for Ukraine agreeing an association agreement and a trade agreement with the European Union. Ukraine was looking for a way to move west. And that posed an existential challenge to Putin. Because Putin knows that a successful Ukraine, a free and democratic Ukraine, a European Ukraine, will work as a magnet on reformers in Russia and will strengthen the hand of reformers in Russia. And that is one of our main self-interests as Europeans. We have never had a good geopolitical answer to the challenge posed by Russia in Europe. What is, who are we and how do we see Russia? Well, here we have an opportunity to work with Ukraine, first in the interest of Ukraine, but secondly in the interest of peaceful democratic developments in our continent over the next couple of decades. That is the challenge. But that means the European Union will also have to look inward and reform itself. This is a huge opportunity to take care of unfinished business in the European Union. I've mentioned the strengthening of democracy. But we also need to think of the countries in the Western Balkans who have applied to join the EU. What are we going to tell them? If we want to take in the 10 countries that have now applied for membership, that will kill decision-making in the Council of Ministers unless we reform that decision-making process, unless we abolish or, re or reduce the use of the veto in the Council of Ministers, so that one small country cannot block the will of all the others, as has happened regularly. For example, in the latest instance with Cyprus blocking our sanctions on Lukashenko in Belarus because we didn't follow the Cyprus line on Turkey. You know, that sort of nonsense has to stop. Um, we need to reform the way the European Union works. And we probably also have to build in some new steps between full membership and non-membership. This membership path takes 10 years. It took Croatia a decade to join the EU. That system doesn't work. We have lost our influence over the Balkans because the system takes too long. So, so we need some intermediate steps. So you're and I think that is why we need to reform the European Union to build in those intermediate steps, to strengthen decision-making, and to strengthen the cohesion of the European Union in economic policy, in defense policy, in energy policy, uh, in environmental policy. A stronger, more effective, more democratic union in order to face up to the challenges of the continent. That is the challenge that we face now, and I think, therefore, we need to have a more ambitious view and aim higher. I think I'm going to leave it at that because we've talked for two hours and um, that's been long enough. Um, we've listened to a, a, a variety of um, a point of views. We've listened to a wonderful introduction by uh, Princess Laurentine and I just want to read out, I'm not going to summarize everything we've, we've been saying. Um, I'm just going to read out the wonderful quote by Lech Wawansa. The sole and basic source of our strength is the solidarity of people who seek to live in dignity, truth, and harmony with their conscience. I think um, uh, if we adhere to that, and I think you are much in agreement with Vasil Khiripalem that this is a moment in which the whole um, European project is challenged and that we need to realize you know, um, what it actually means from a value point of view what we're doing here. Take our democracy serious, take our history serious, um, take our cooperation serious, um, and take the agenda serious. I've um, overdone my welcome by seven minutes. I apologize to you. Um, thank you for coming here. Uh, thank you for listening, and thank you for participating, everybody here on the table. Uh, thank you for cooperating with the European Cultural Foundation.